Greetings, comrades. Sorry for the delay. We do try our hardest to keep on on schedule, though, but life sometimes just happens. We are very thankful to all of our listeners here, and uh, we had this great interview with Dan, and we were on Tom Wood's show, which is amazing. Uh, not everything is terrible. Only most things. At any rate, this episode will be about the new economic policy, about power struggles within the Communist Party during this period, and about how Lenin finally departed from this world, and how Stalin, our good old friend Stalin, or should I say Koba, as we have known him before, really started to take power. But first, to get into the mood of things, a joke originating in this NEP era to start this off, obviously created in Odessa, where else? <clears throat> Armenian radio gets asked, what exactly is uh, Russian business? Armenian radio answers, <clears throat> well, it's like this, you steal, a, you steal a box of vodka, then you sell the vodka, and you buy booze for the money that you have acquired. So, this is what we'll be dealing here, comrades. Let's try to make some sense first, though. To talk about this new economic policy, first off, we again need to take a small step back and discuss this Kronstadt uprising. Because, yes, the new economic policy became a reality after this Kronstadt uprising. And, the, and it caused Lenin to rethink a lot of his policies of war communism and what had been going on there. And this Kronstadt uprising is important because uh, the sailors at Kronstadt naval base near Petrograd had been dissenting since forever, basically. They were there, uh, mutinying and rebelling in the 1905 revolution, and they were also playing an important role uh, with Nicholas II, our good old friend Nicky, when he issued his October Manifesto. They also were amongst the most active people who participated in the overthrow of Tsar in the February Revolution. A lot of these, a lot of these sailors were really hardcore Bolsheviks, and during the October Revolution, they kind of took over, just captured the cruiser Aurora, and had sailed it up the river Neva, and actually had fired on the Winter Palace to, to help it, to help it all, to help out for the revolutionary causes. And according to, <clears throat> and according to a eyewitness of the events, certain Bertram D. Wolf, <clears throat> they jailed their officers without trial in the same hell holes that had been used to discipline them, and drowned or bloody lynched many. Uh, by the way, Leon Trotsky later wrote about this, that <clears throat> the most hateful of the officers were shoved under the ice, of course, while still alive. Bloody acts were ret of retribution were as inevitable as the recoil of a gun. So you see, they were really radical elements, very pro-Bolshevik, very ruthless in their actions, following Lenin's orders on mass terror to the letter. But, because of all of this war communism and just general poverty, and the fact that the Bolshevik government had become increasingly, increasingly more dictatorial than it actually had been in the beginning, where some semblance was, was there, and it wasn't just all about infighting, by 1921... The Kronstadt sailors had become completely disillusioned with this Bolshevik government. They were completely angry about this, about this lack of any representation, and they hated war communism. A uh, Soviet historian, David Shubb, wrote about them. <clears throat> Quote, On the 1st of March, 1921, the sailors of Kronstadt revolted against Lenin. Mass meetings of 15,000 men from various ships and garrisons passed resolutions demanding immediate new elections to the Soviet by secret ballot, freedom of speech, and the press for all left-wing socialist parties, freedom of assembly for trade unions and peasant organizations, abolition of communist political agencies in the army and navy, immediate withdrawal of all great requisitioning squads, and re-establishment of a free market for the peasants. So these, these are their demands. And this, they, they did this on the 1st of March. A bit earlier, previously, <clears throat> on the 28th of February 1921, just, uh, j just basically in the previous day, the crew of the battleship Petropavlovsk had also passed resolution calling for return of full politi political freedoms. And following this previous uh, statement, on the 4th of March, they issued the following statement themselves. <clears throat> Quote, Comrade workers, red soldiers and sailors, we stand for the power of the Soviets and not that of the parties. We are for free representation of all who toil. 
Comrades, you are being misled. At Kronstadt, all power is in the hands of the revolutionary sailors, of red soldiers and workers. It is not in the hands of white guards allegedly headed by General Kozlovsky, as the Moscow radio tells you. And yeah, here you can see that even back then, if you were disappointed in the system, then, well, Moscow says what Moscow needs to say. And you will probably be, probably be oppressed by this. Uh, another, another thing that really, really should be pointed out here is that by this point, uh, this Kronstadt Rebellion is just the most famous one. It kind of, uh, kind of signifies what was going on there at the end of this war communism. There were minor revolts all over the place. This was just the most known and the biggest one, and uh, it turned out to be the bloodiest one as well. And it was a bit crazy, because this Kronstadt base near Petrograd was extremely important strategically. So, it had to be dealt with. So, of course, our good old friend Lenin denounced the Kronstadt uprising, as he really thought that this might just spark the continuation of the war and would just incite workers everywhere, because small rebellions were go going, around <laughs> going on all around the place. So, he denounced this uprising as a plot, apparently created by the White Army and their foul European supporters. Following him, on the 6th of March, our, also another one of our good friends, Trotsky, issued a statement. <clears throat> Quote, I order all those who have raised a hand against the socialist fatherland immediately to lay down their weapons. Those who resist will be disarmed and put at the disposal of the Soviet command. The arrested commissars and other representatives of the government must be freed immediately. Only those who surrender unconditionally will be able to count on the clemency of the Soviet Republic. And, you know, usually what, what would happen in these situations, he really didn't wait until anyone surrendered or didn't even care about their demands. He just ordered the army to just attack the Kronstadt sailors. And our good old, another one of our, oh man, we, we, we have, we have accumulated so many great people, good friends of the show, so to speak, in these series. And here comes in Felix, Felix Jerzynski, the head of Cheka who was also kind of, vol who kind of volunteered to just, you know, I'm just gonna lend some uh, Cheka guys there, you know, to, to make, make out, ma make out what's going on there, just, you know, to help out. And our previous eyewitness, Victor Serge, he points out, <clears throat> quote, Lacking any qualified officers, the Kronstadt sailors did not know how to employ their artillery. There was, it is true, a former officer named Kozlovsky among them, but he did little and exercised no authority. Some of the rebels managed to reach Finland. Others put up a furious resistance, fort to fort and street to street. Hundreds of prisoners were taken away to Petrograd and handed to the Cheka. Months later, they were still being shot in small batches, a senseless and criminal agony. Those defeated sailors belonged body and soul to the revolution. They had voiced the suffering in the will of the Russian people. This protracted massacre was either, super, either supervised or permitted by Dzerzhinsky, and most likely ordered by him as well. And some also some some other observers from the area claim that many of the victims would kind of die shouting communist slogans like "Long live the communist international" and "Long live the assembly" and you know other pro-communist slogans while they were literally massacred and and shot down by the communists, the communist party, which at this point the Kronstadt sailors did not really associate with the uh, true true caring about the peasants and everyone else going on here. Basically, these battles raged on in Petrograd until the 17th of March. And then, by this point, the government forces took, oh, took control of this Kronstadt base. Approximately, approximately 8,000 people who had participated in this Kronstadt rebellion, of, of whom many were also civilians, it doesn't include just the sailors, they, they left Kronstadt and escaped to Finland. Official figures, by the way, Official figures from the era, and, and that's Soviet records, so, you know, take them with a grain of salt, suggest that, <clears throat> and, you know, they, they are not very reliable, they like to downplay things a bit. They should, they suggest that 527 people were killed, and 4,127 were wounded. Now, obviously, <laughs> Obviously, I, I looked up more research on this, and yeah, the the average belief of modern day historians, including those including those in Russia and including those in the West, obviously obviously believe that the total number of casualties was was much higher than this. 
Now, we, we can't really tell the total number of, of casualties here, uh, but yeah. Look, if, if the Soviet government, who always downplays every bad thing that happens in the Soviet Union, suggests that, you know, 500 people died and, like, 4,000-something were wounded, then, you know, it must have been really, really bad to just publish these numbers. Otherwise, they would say that, you know, 7 people died and, I don't know, 15 more were wounded. Leon Trotsky was also got, got, a, got a reminder around these parts from Nikolai Sukhanov that <clears throat> three years previously, Trotsky had told the people of Petrograd, quote, <clears throat> We shall conduct the work of Petrograd Soviet in the spirit of lawfulness and of full freedom for all parties. The hand of the Presidium will never lend itself to the suppression of the minority. And Trotsky apparently, upon being reminded that he had said this, just lapsed into silence for a while and then... Uh, and just sighed and said, well, those were the good old days. Kind of, <laughs> kind of interesting. Because, yeah, when, while Trotsky, while Trotsky is stating this, documents reveal that while this conversation is going on, some 500 sailors after this rebellion has already ended, approximately uh, another 500 sailors were just executed by Czech by this point. And there are also claims later that, uh, Claims made by witnesses later that uh, when Trotsky apparently had put down the Kronstadt uprising, the Bolshevik, that the, a lot of people state that this is the moment where the Bolshevik government really lo loses all contact with revolution, and that this is the beginning of state terror and dictatorial rule. Now, on one side, it's it's kind of weird because mass terror. And, and dictatorship happened previously, and this constant rebellion would be followed by our main subject today, the new economic policy. But even though, even though it kind of was, was a period of, of, uh, having a breather in the Soviet Union, this new economic policy, at least for a while, while that was going on, major political battles were raging on. And, and they happened in the background, and at the end, it was it was these political battles that ushered in a new era of mass murders, repressions, and even more terror than previously. And yeah, Leon Trotsky was not exactly not exactly uh, happy about what was going on here, and he wasn't really amused by this. And later, later he mused in his his writings that. Uh, that the anarchists were actually responsible for this uh, uprising, especially blaming their leader, one Nestor Machno. So Trotsky wrote that, uh, quote, Machno was a mixture of fanatic and adventurer. He became the concentration of the very tendencies which brought about the Kronstadt uprising. Machno created a cavalry of peasants who supplied their own horses. They were not downtrodden village poor whom the October Revolution first awakened, but the strong and well-fed peasants who were afraid of losing what they had. The anarchist ideas of Macno, which was the ignoring of the state, non-recognition of the central power, etc., these corresponded to the spirit of the Kulak cavalry as nothing else could. I should add that the hatred of the city and the city worker on the part of the followers of Macno was complemented by, the, by their militant anti-Semitism. How that got thrown in there, I don't know, but uh, yeah. Trotsky himself blames the anarchists for this, but at the same time, it's at the same time, Trotsky also puts Felix, Felix Dzerzhinsky, a very wild and evil man, mind you, even though there were children's books written about him, you know, brave Czechists, with steady arms and cold, with, with steady, with steady hands and cold hearts and a brilliant smile. That, that's, that's how we're described in these Soviet children's books, but yeah. Trotsky also, you know, accuses later in his later writings Dzerzhinsky of being fully responsible for the massacre. And he writes, quote, <clears throat> The truth of the matter is that I personally did not participate in the least in the suppression of the Kronstadt Rebellion, nor in the repressions following the suppression. In my eyes, this very fact is of no political significance. I was a member of the government. I considered the quelling of the rebellion necessary, and therefore I bear responsibility for the suppression. Concerning the repressions, as far as I remember, Dzerzhinsky had personal charge of them, and Dzerzhinsky could not tolerate anyone's interference with his functions. And then he adds in comments, and properly so. Whether there were any needless victims, I do not know. On this score, I trust Dzerzhinsky more than his belated critics. So, you know, <clears throat> Trotsky, uh, even though he, he shows some remorse here, it's kind of hard to believe that uh, 
A man who wanted to set the world afire with the communist revolution had nothing to do with mass repressions. The man who literally ran the Red Army by this point when this happened. At any rate, weirdly enough, Lenin, at this point, proved to be more sensible than the rest of these leaders, the rest of these leaders of the Communist Party. And this, this is how we come to this new economic policy, because Lenin, after this rebellion, came to a conclusion that, <clears throat> quote, only by coming to an agreement with the peasants can we save the socialist revolution. So in a way, in a way, Lenin actually tried to introduce some capitalism in the system to basically save his socialists. He, on this new plan to save socialism, also wrote in April 1921, that is just one month after this Kronstadt rebellion, or just two weeks after it ended, <clears throat> quote, State capitalism would be a step forward as compared with the present state of affairs in our Soviet Republic. If in approximately six months' time, state capitalism became established in our Republic, this would be a great success and a sure guarantee that within a year, socialism will have gained a permanently firm hold and will have become invincible in this country. So it's kind of weird that, uh, that yeah, you have to institute some capitalism so that, so that this would happen. Meanwhile, by the way, while this is happening, while this is happening, there is a Red Army invasion of Georgia. Essentially, uh, led by Stalin, mind you, which is important by this point. From the 15th of February to 17th of March, 1921, a Soviet-Georgian war is going on. It's also just known as Soviet invasion of Georgia. Because the Democratic Republic of Georgia, which had previously previously been been there after, after all these civil wars, had elected a socialist democratic, that is, Menshevik government there. So... Due to, due to Trotskyist expansionist policy, what was going on everywhere, basically the Soviets just launch an invasion there to just overtake it, and Joseph Stalin played a huge role in this. Which will also lead to further uh, so-called Georgian affair, which was essentially a conflict conflict between the fact whether or not Georgia should have autonomy or, or or should have just some of degree of autonomy or should it be included in the Soviet Soviet Russia completely or whether or not the, it should join it should join the Soviet Union as a federation but we'll get to that when we get to 1922 but yeah essentially this is this is what happens here while this Kronstadt rebellion is going on while there is still war communism Forces basically led by Stalin, who's, who plays a very important role there, invade Georgia to overthrow the Mensh Mensheviks. This also plays a part in the political games. Now, what happens here is that Stalin, Stalin tries to make this new economic policy to kind of calm everyone down, because he thought that even though if Constantine rebellion would have been successful, it would have sparked a whole new revolution, maybe. At least Lenin thought so. But at the same time, this violent and brutal oppression of this rebellion, which was was basically there, and it wasn't whites who did it, it was just communists, fellow fellow Bolsheviks who did it. So it was extra, extra painful. They thought, you know, for Bolsheviks to kill other Bolsheviks is, is kind of a bad thing to do, and he was... He was really afraid of what was going on there. And he wanted to calm everyone down. And he also just needed this to maintain the party's hold on power by this point. So, the 10th Party Congress in March 1921, at, at the very end of March, introduced the measures of this new economic policy. Now, what, the, what these things are. First off, these measures included the return of most agriculture retail trade, and small-scale light industry to private ownership and management, while the state retained control of heavy industry, transport, banking, and foreign trade. Next year, in 1922, money would be reintroduced into economy, because during war communism, basically, there was no money, it was just bartering, you had to pay your tax, you didn't even pay taxes, your grain would be just completely taken from you, Everything you produce would be taken from you, and then it would be redistributed, thus just killing any economic growth. And how did they institute this situation? You see, this policy was based around a tax called <clears throat> Prodnalog. 
uh, which is short for production tax. R- Soviets love to love to shorten everything. This was a tax on food. By introducing this tax, Lenin was essentially admitting that yes, he was taxing something people owned. Previously, requisition had, like I said, forcibly taken food just from people, but this taxed people at a much lower level than the level set for requisition. It was around 10% at the beginning, even. So, this allowed the people who then pay their taxes to keep the rest of what they produced, which was very new for the Soviet system. Food that was left over could be sold. Thus, peasants had the incentive to grow as much as they could, knowing that they could keep what was not taxed. And, interestingly enough, the amount of grain taxed in 1922 was half of the grain taken by force in 1920 to 1921. The same was true for the tax on potatoes, by the way. Now, in the previous narrative episode, I mentioned how this war communism basically starved the cities, because if you just violently take all the grain from the peasants, they, they really have no incentive to grow more food. This, again, allowed the cities to be fed. This allowed the cities of the Soviet Union to actually receive, receive their, their nutrition. And by the way, while we're in, while we're in 1922, and I'll get back to that, but honestly speaking, this really involves all the politicking that's going on in the background because NEP caused a rift in the party, which would later cause some terrible things to happen. You see, NEP wasn't that popular by by everyone, really. Leon Trotsky was extremely opposed to this new economic policy because he was a permanent revolutionary. And this led uh, to a rift in his relations with, with Lenin. This, in turn, while Lenin was really thinking about what was going on there, led Lenin to support Stalin a bit more than usual. Even though there are a lot of Trotskyists in power by this point, and even though Stalin is kind of now supported by Lenin, because Lenin needs allies. Lenin was always the polemical person, the person who who always thought influenced others. By this point, Trotskyists decide to basically put Lenin somewhere out of power. Somewhere just, you know, put him in a position that looks important so that Lenin is happy, but, you know, some, some like, unimportant position, something where he would just push papers around all day, he wouldn't be the face of the revolution, he wouldn't be up there with the rest of us, he wouldn't enjoy, so to speak, all the glory that comes with leading revolution. And due to Trotsky's support for this, and due to how Lenin also kind of thought forward, by this point in 1922... Stalin becomes the general secretary of the Communist Party. Now, now, those those people who know something about the Soviet Union and those who have listened to my previous shows would now be screaming in terror and stating, wait a minute, wait a minute, Lenin is still alive, how can Stalin be general secretary? What's going on here? Well, let me explain it to you. At this point, becoming a general secretary is really being promoted to oblivion, essentially. It's an important position. It's an important position which Stalin had really acquired by fun, by just being there, being very nearby power all the time, uh, robbing banks for the Bolshevik party, uh, being decisive in, in this Georgian invasion, then basically consolidating, like pushing, pushing the local Georgian communists out of power, even like Georgian Bolsheviks out of power to institute the very loyal to Moscow ones there. And by this point, Stalin gets appointed general secretary. And uh, I, I've watched a lot of documentaries for this uh, for this episode. So, like all of the, even modern Russian historians, uh, who usually and quite often really portray everything as massive propaganda, as they they even state, and this is kind of uh, coming from historical documentaries, who are quite glorifying Stalin. Actually, they all note that Stalin recognized that the revolution was over. That unlike Trotsky, who dreamt about world revolution, and Lenin, who by this point is becoming more and more ill. Because, you know, his longtime lover of, say, 14 to 16 years, Inessa Armand, which was a French, French communist who became a, ma- a lover of uh, Lenin, and she actually took care of Lenin and became became his aide, but this happened to a point that Lenin, Krupskaya, and Ines Armand lived together for multiple years, and Krupskaya was just ordered to accept this. Okay, she passed away from cholera in 1920. She passed away two years before this. She was age 40, 46, and this this also 
took a toll on Lenin. For example, she died at the age of 46 because she had ran and edited the newspaper Pravda for a long while. And Lenin noticed, Lenin noticed that she was just becoming really, really exhausted because she had worked all through the revolution as re- and really was responsible for this newspaper and she was editing what Lenin wrote as well and everything. So instead, in 1920, Lenin decides to just send her away to go to Caucasus for a holiday. But at this point, Lenin does not know that this area had not been completely pacified by the Red Army and that the area had a massive cholera epidemic because Trotsky never told him about this situation, which is, again, another nail in the coffin for for Mr. Trotsky there. But yeah, she dies. And apparently Lenin loved her quite a bit more, like, essentially loved her quite a bit more than Krupskaya, because uh, in the Sarmant, and and you you can look at her, she was always this beautiful, frail French woman, while Nadezhda Krupskaya was this very Russian, very kind of bulky, stocky peasant woman, very diligent and trustworthy, but she wasn't a beauty queen. Ines Armand is, is, you know, just kind of much more visually appealing than Krupskaya at this point, and, and kind of with, with her, and she has this French bourgeoisie aura around her, which Krupskaya doesn't have. So yeah, you can, you can just, <laughs> then this, this tale of Krupskaya and how all of this, all of this was, was going on with her, that's, that's kind of crazy actually. Now, by this point, also, a lot of rumors are going around, and quite substantial rumors that Lenin actually suffered from syphilis, because he wasn't just, uh, so to speak, playing around with Ines uh, and his wife, Trubskaya. He was just doing it uh, a lot since the revolution. So, or, or just he had done it previously while he was in Switzerland. There are a lot of theories how Lenin could have acquired syphilis, but it's one of the biggest reasons what's going on there. Because... <laughs> As, as you might understand, Lenin was never autopsied after his death. He was just preserved in mausoleum, which, uh, which will, by the way, by the way, we'll, we will dedicate a whole episode to Lenin's preservation. So yeah, by this point in 1922, Stalin is approved general secretary of the party. Trotsky thinks he will be able to keep the power. But Stalin just quietly understands that this position is extremely important because being a general secretary allows him to manage, manage basically human resources of the communists. It allows him to put people in positions of power, just all the mid-level guys, all the important people around everywhere. Essentially, this allows him to just stack up the communist party's administrative positions of some importance with people who then would be completely loyal to him. Essentially put his people everywhere in power. And that's eventually, that eventually, by the way, will lead, will lead to the doom of Trotsky and everyone, literally, literally everyone else around Lenin at this, at this time. So yeah, year is 1922. Stalin has just become general secretary and there is this new economic policy going on there. But yeah, this economic freedom that Anep introduced obviously worked, for a while at least, and it restored Lenin and Bolsheviks to more stability and political power. It also expanded Russia's economic base. Lenin at this point admitted openly in one of his letters that the war communism had been a grievous error. Essentially, during this 10th party congress where the new economic policy was uh, was kind of accepted there, the congress also in its statement of, of uh, introducing this policy recognized that, yes, this was just because of the rebellions, and in, and... Really, they understood that some radical measures should be adopted. But even though this happened, like I said, a lot of Trotskists around there. A lot of people who are not happy about what was going on at all. The hardliners, being Trotsky, interpreted that all of this was just a step backwards, that this is a betrayal of the revolution. Stalin, meanwhile, Stalin doesn't care. Stalin is really... Of, of this by this point. He will come, he will become very interested in, in uh, new economic policy by 1925, and when he gains power, he will completely abolish it. But for now, Stalin is very neutral. Stalin, being the extremely cunning man that he was, just saw this as a way to gain, <laughs> gain power, so to speak. Interestingly enough, this, this NEP thing, with later introduction of money, and then it was no longer a grain tax, it was a monetary tax, 
and all these farmers that live in in Russia. They basically needed the middle needed some middlemen now because they produced grain, they brought it to the cities, and some middlemen were needed to just spread it spread it around. That you needed some stores for this. So this created this so-called <clears throat> nipman. These people were kind of um, opportunistic middlemen retailers who were mostly shopkeepers, salesmen, and market stallholders who obtained items wholesale or secondhand and then just sold them for a profit. And this this was an activity. This was this was pure speculation, and uh, we have spoken about this speculation that was completely illegal and would get you shot. Now you could do this. Weirdly enough, this only benefited the, the farmers and the light industry. And the industries basically that were given away to private enterprise were those for whom the state at this point during the NEP saw that, you know, they couldn't run efficiently. Like, state couldn't really run small businesses efficiently or and they just decided to, you know what, let's privatize, let's do some limited privatization of the things that we can't run. At the same time, by introducing this this measure, a lot of the farmers who had previously during war communism moved to industrial areas due to being a farmer would literally mean that you'd starve, and even though the cities got less food, cities also were the places if you were successful enough you would kind of kind of get some grain. It was a complex situation. Well, the big cities at least. So, uh, small cities were just starving around, like, and rebelling. But, you know, that, that made a lot of, lot of farmers just to move to St. Petersburg and Moscow, and Minsk, and, you know, these capitals of these Soviet republics. As a, as a consequence of all of this, you know, there, they, they could find job in massive industry, because during this war communism era, and still later on after the NEP in socialism, there was no unemployment. It was basically like this. Uh, the the businesses didn't operate efficiently. Previously, you know, if a business, let's say you're you're a small you're a small co- company who produces clothing or something, and you only need three workers to work in your factory, but everyone needs to be employed. So you know, you hire five workers, and you know, you split these three wages that you had before to these five workers, and everyone works. Everyone receives very meager, terrible pay that is basically barely even sustenance pay, and often wasn't, but everyone has a job and everyone has a small attempt of doing these things. Now, when the privatization was introduced, obviously, these people who were looking for a profit didn't run it the very inefficient, in this very, very inefficient way. No, no, no. They hired only, like, if a company needs three workers, they would just fire the rest, which caused some unemployment. But for these people who were who were there in the big cities... And we're talking mostly about mostly about people who, under any normal situation, would have a hard time finding finding la- finding a, a job opportunity. We're, we're talking about like the dispossessed during the civil war, people without education, often even people who used to used to have criminal ties, workers of extremely low qualification, essentially without any any skill or something, people who are very hardly employable, anyways. They started to cause some ruckus there because, like I said, this class of people had moved to the big cities because that's where they could survive, at least somehow. And now they had unemployment issues, which caused them to actually, especially in Minsk and Kiev, to kind of start rumbling around there, which would cause troubles for the NEP later on, and which would be also one of the reasons which Stalin later used to abolish the NEP. But throughout all of this situation, what was going on here was that by the mid-1920s, uh, Russia's agricultural output had been restored to pre-World War I levels. You see, in 1913, Russia produced around 80 million tons of grain. By 1921, this had fallen to less than 50 million tons. However, four years of this new economic policy saw it increase back up to 72.5 million tons. There were a lot of improvements in industrial production and the wages of industrial workers too, which is the part, mind you, which uh, a lot of socialist sites tend to promote this as why is Lenin did this, and that yes, for those industrial workers who were skilled, who worked efficiently, and who could keep their jobs, that would really, really, their wages would increase and they would start living better. 
But at the same time, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people in these big cities, again, were losing their jobs. Hi, this is Alice. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Border. We would like to say hi to all the new listeners who arrived after our interview with Dan Carlin, or those who came here after listening to the Tom Woods Show. For those who haven't checked Tom out already, we're on the episode 914, and it can be found in every podcasting app. We would like to say thank you to all our Patreon supporters. You are the bread of our lives. We would like to mention all our latest patrons who have joined up this month. Robert, Zach, Beth, Ben, Travis, and Sasha. Christos has forgotten to mention this a while ago, so I've taken the opportunity on myself, and I hope that you forgive us. Anyone who would like to become a patron and get access to patron-only content can become a patron on patreon.com slash the eastern border. You can also buy our t-shirts and mugs and check out our website at theeasternborder.lv. Of course, we are also on Facebook, The Eastern Border, and Twitter, at The Eastern Border. We are proud members of the Dark Myths Collective, and this month's featured show is Bohemian Podcast by our dear friend Travis J. Doe and Peter Coleman. They are Americans and lived and worked in Prague for 10 years. Peter is still there, and Travis has been on our show when we discussed the fall of Berlin Wall. They make an amazing show about the history and culture of another Eastern Bloc country. They do focus on the whole history of Bohemia, though, but we've also been happy enough to be on their show when they wanted us to comment on the Bonnie stories in the Soviet Czechoslovakia. And finally, thank you all for your emails. We've only answered a few of them, but we have read all of them. We're very busy here, and we'll make some time to answer the rest of them as well. We're still collecting questions for the Q&A show, which will come out in late June for our second show anniversary episode. Thank you for listening. And now, back to the show. So, NEP had positive results overall, but it had a lot of issues as well. And let's turn back to our eyewitness from the era, Victor Serge. He recorded, <clears throat> the new economic policy was, in the space of a few months, already giving marvelous, marvelous results. From one week to the next, the famine and the speculation were diminishing perceptibly. Restaurants were opening again, and, wonder of wonders, pastries which were actually edible were on sale as a ruble apiece. The public was beginning to recover its breath, and people were apt to talk about the return of capitalism, which was synonymous with prosperity. However... And uh, previously I mentioned that, you know, the, the masses of very, very low-skilled workers who had just came to the cities previously had been pa having been parts of Russian serfdom and then Russian, Russian peasantry, often being completely illiterate because imp improvement of literacy ratings in, uh, in, in Russian territories was one of the biggest achievements of the Soviet Union, which they really took seriously. But by this point, a lot of people just simply can't read there. And in the countryside, not everything was just as rosy as people had thought. For example, Raymond Graham Swing of the Chicago Daily News, who visited the countryside during this period, had a very interesting and different interpretation of these events. Quote, <clears throat> Before boarding our boat at Samara, we visited the market where, under the so-called new economic policy recently adopted by Lenin, we watched the peasants selling food for their personal profit, food they had grown on their small private garden plots. But the peasants had little food to sell, and they themselves were haggard and undernourished. We bought some black bread and goat cheese to eat on the boat. I have never seen a more harrowing sight than people starving to death. After an overnight ride from Samara, we stopped at an encampment of refugees, several hundred of them, who had come to the river from the interior in the hope of being taken away by the government to regions where they could obtain food and lodging. They had built shelters of leafless branches, but they had little to eat but grass. The state had done nothing to save them. So though, even though NEP had allowed some freedom of internal trade and permitted some private commerce, this was really, really bad for a lot of peasants outside there. And again, this is the result of, during the war communism, the countryside basically got depopulated, because these people just went to work in the cities. So not everyone in the countryside, not everyone in the countryside who was a farmer really really enjoyed much of, of the situation. Even though you have to admit, this was better than being shot for not giving your grain away com completely. But now we have moved our study to about 
to about 1925. And this is, again, <laughs> we're watching around the nap and what's going on there, but this is a very interesting period of the Soviet Union. So it's time to again step back while this snap is going on and we had sketched in some internal conflicts. You see, I mentioned Lenin being very ill and possibly suffering from syphilis or some other other diseases. Lenin begins dying by this point. Lenin was mm, stricken with his first cerebral hemorrhage in May 1922. And this is where the question of eventual succession to leadership of, of, of all this state becomes urgent. And Stalin had basically a month ago became the general secretary and started just flooding the ranks of the Communist Party with his own people. Now, the obvious candidate for all of this was Trotsky, owing to his obvious record of, of, of military successes and his loyalty to the Communist cause for this eternal revolution, and obviously he was quite charismatic as well. But this caused a lot of jealousy among his colleagues in the Politburo. And even though they had previously united, sort of united to push Stalin aside, right now, again, because of the influence of Stalin, the rest of Politburo kind of decides to combine against him. As an alternative, by this point, the Politburo supports the informal leadership of this certain called uh, certain Troika, which is composed uh, by this point by Grigory Zinoviev, Lev Kamenev, and Stalin. This is where Stalin really, really gets gets to power. In the winter of 1922-23, Lenin recovered partially and turned to Trotsky in assistance in correcting the errors of Troika, particularly in their foreign trade policy, the handling of the national minorities, and the reform of bureaucracy. Now, Stalin did not like Lenin at all by this point, because all the, all their conflicts essentially stemmed from the fact that whether or not the, the, the multiple Soviet countries should be fully annexed in the Russian, Russian state of the uh, Russian state, or they would just join up as more or less independent republics, with the possibility of leaving the Union. Because, yes, Lenin had sort of thought that, you know, we should make a Soviet Union, but there should be a Russian... R Russian. Well, basically, Lenin supported the model of the Soviet Union as it was formed, while Stalin more or less wanted everyone to just join up in the single country, single federal country, with limited autonomy for the regions. Also, Stalin insisted that the these regions shouldn't have the rights of leaving the Soviet Union. Which actually will happen later, where Stalin takes absolute power, but by then, the Soviet Union had been formed, the, the, the Soviet Union had been formed, by the way, 1922 is when the official constitution is being written, so this is again extremely important, as Lenin is essentially dying, and there's leadership issues, and the NEP has just been instituted, and they need to write a constitution for their new country as the civil war has ended. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, as we all know, Stalin did sort of win, because even though he wanted this united federated country, with more or less very centralized federated country, but still with very limited autonomy for the regions, it was formed as a union of republics. Stalin later massively curbed the rights of the republics, but he couldn't completely just unify them in a very single country. Weirdly enough, Lenin, Lenin sort of thought that... Uh, <laughs> sort of thought that, you know, people should be there and they should be able to leave the Soviet Union. Even though a lot of historians argue that it was actually actually just a, a PR movement anyways. Interestingly enough, Lenin, at the first time, he really didn't, didn't protest against this autonomization, as it's called by modern Russian historians of this country. At the beginning of uh, 1922... Quite, quite, uh, it was quite realistic that a completely united socialist Russia, who would at that point include also Ukraine, Belarus, and Caucasus countries, that, that could be formed. But this was kind of put back, the kind of uh, put aside a bit. Interestingly enough, by the initiative of Stalin, because in the January of 1922, the People's Commissar of Foreign Matters, Chicherin, basically put forward a question to the Politburo. Well, how do we 
basically do it? How how do we represent the national republics in in this international international conference in in Gen- Geneva? Basically, the leading powers at the time kind of were okay with uh, with having discussions and having talks with the Russian Federation, Russian Socialist Federation by this point, but they really, really insisted against uh, its satellites mentioned previously to kind of getting in, getting in this this conference. Now, at this point, uh, the the kind of the People's Commissary of Internal Affairs just offered, you know what? Let's just include them all in this Russian Federation and be done with it. But Stalin, again, wisely, because uh, one thing you can one thing you can really, really state about Stalin that he was he was evil, very evil, but also very wise. He said that you know what, if we do that right away after this nap we, and after these recent recent uh, after this recent end of the war, we might get in a huge trouble. How about how about we do it in a, in a couple of months? Like how about we assimilate them slowly? But Lenin, during these months, understood that something was wrong with this idea. He didn't like it, and especially at this point, at this point when he recovered. Uh, kind of d- during during the later periods uh, during these these six months, he started to to basically publicly writing things from his hospital bed against this idea, opposing Stalin. But Stalin, by this point, being in this troika, essentially wanted to curb Lenin's power to influence any policy whatsoever. He was a major figure in the Communist Party. He was the public image. But by now, the and so was Trotsky. But by now, the era of charismatic leaders and mega public figures. It had to end, even though Stalin will will create an even more insane personal cult than Lenin. But being a very very charismatic, huge figure, the the PR face of the nation did not bring power anymore. It was not how you consolidated power. It was not how you ran the Soviet Union. So Stalin, at this point, decides that Lenin, even though he's recovered. He also will get later, he will also, by the way, Lenin will suffer from more strokes. But by this point, Stalin decides to just, you know, send Lenin uh, to relax, uh, relax in, in like a, a summer, summer kind of sanatorium. Just get him out of Moscow. Get him far away. Put him just, uh, just and publicly state that, oh, this is, this is so the great leader could relax. And obviously, due to him having very quickly and very efficiently put his people into all the voting positions that matter, and thus, in, thus basically creating, creating this general secretary position as a position of power from just purely secretarial things, which was, which it was originally, he just puts Lenin on a boat. And Lenin, while he's recuperating and recovering, Lenin starts to notice that something is very, very, very wrong here. And there's a new Congress coming, by the way. So Lenin writes his famous letter to the Congress. This, uh, le- this, this letter to the Congress was, in a way, in a way it was Lenin's testament. That's how it was treated. It was supposed to be read aloud at the 12th Party Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was planned for April 1923. At this point, Lenin, uh, at this point, Lenin, at, at the late 1922, he's kind of recovering, but he's being sent to the sanatorium, and as he's criticizing Stalin, Stalin decides that, oh, no, 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 Lenin needs to relax more. Lenin really needs to relax more, and very much limits his time on how much he could work, as by this point, he's paralyzed. He, he can barely write. Essentially, he has to have visitors who help him write, who help him operate, who help to participate in the political work. And as Lenin starts to write these things, criticizing Stalin and changing his changing his modus operandi here, because Stalin really is because because Lenin recognizes Stalin as a massive hardliner who's just doing it very ruthlessly and efficiently. Stalin again, again visits Lenin personally, and we don't have records of their private conversations. But what Lenin after what Lenin wrote after was that Stalin essentially threatened Lenin completely. Stalin also even more severely limited what amount of Lenin, what, what amounts Lenin could just receive visitors and what he could write. 
and it was it was crazy crazy limited. I mean, he couldn't completely stop Lenin from from working because if Lenin didn't write and people knew he was alive, then then things would be kind of kind of crazy. The Soviet Union needed Lenin as their central, the most important leader, the most important figure. But Stalin recognized that, yeah, we need a figure, not someone who tries to somehow influence my plans of taking over the country. Stalin even managed to call Nadezhda Krupskaya and yell at her on the phone. And Lenin managed to send a letter to the Central Committee, uh, kind of stating that Stalin should apologize to his wife for insulting her on the phone. He called her anti-communist, he called her that, you know, he again offended her due to this previous affair with Ines Armand. By the way, uh, Stalin would later really fight to eliminate Ines Armand from all the public records. He really tried to basically make sure that she was never known, that she would never be recognized, because, oh, Stalin really, really hated her. her. He was set out to destroy her legacy. And by the way, by the 1930s, uh, her work had been completely forgotten in the Soviet Union. Stalin really tried to eliminate everything there. But yeah, after after Stalin after he after Lenin criticizes Stalin again, Stalin threatens him. Stalin puts him on even more hold there. All the while he's being in Moscow and organizing things there for his inevitable uh, his inevitable ascent to power. And uh, Lenin by this point gets his second stroke, which leaves him almost completely unable to work. It becomes like very, very hard for him to do anything, and Lenin by this point feels that he's close to death, and apparently he also refused to take any painkillers. Because he thought that these painkillers would numb his mind at the moment at the moment where he really needed it the most. Very late, nineteen twenty two, he starts dictating and writing his last letter, his uh so called letter to the Congress, so to speak. Now, there are there are many things that Lenin introduced in this thing. Uh, by the way, it was meant to be read in April, but after his third stroke already, it was kept by his wife, Mukrupskaya, in secret. Now, what was written in this what was written in this Lenin's testament? We have a whole text available here, but I will just read part three of this. <clears throat> Addition to the above letter. Stalin is too rude, and this defect, although quite tolerable in our midst and in dealing among us communists, becomes intolerable in the Secretary General. That is why I suggest that the comrades think about a way of removing Stalin from that post and appointing another man, who is, who in his stead, who in all respects differs from Comrade Stalin in having only one advantage. Namely, that of being more tolerant, more loyal, more polite, and more considerate to the comrades, less capricious, etc. This circumstance may appear to be a negligible detail. But I think that from the standpoint of, of safe, safeguards against the split, and from the standpoint of what I wrote above about the relationship between Stalin and Trotsky, it is not a minor detail, but it is a detail which can assume this is of importance. And yeah, this is addition in the previous previous letter. The previous letter, part two of this, because he wrote this in five five parts, essentially, was that... <clears throat> Our party relies on two classes and therefore its instability would be possible and its downfall inevitable if there were no agreement between those two classes. Those two classes being the farmers and the proletariat. In that event, this or that measure, and generally all talk about the stability of our communist com central committee, would be futile. No measure of any kind could prevent a split in such a case. But I hope that this is too remote a future and too improbable an event to talk about. I, st I have in mind stability as a guarantee against the split in the immediate future, and I intend to deal here with a few ideas concerning personal qualities. I think that from this standpoint the prime factors in the question of stability are such members of the Central Committee as Stalin and Trotsky. I think relations between them make up the, gen the greater part of the danger of a split, which could be avoided, and in this purpose, in my opinion, would be served, among other things, by increasing the number of Central Committee members to 50 or even 100. Comrade Stalin, having become Secretary General, has unlimited authority concentrated in his hands, and I am not sure whether he will always be capable of using that authority with sufficient caution. Comrade Trotsky, on the other hand, 
as his struggle against the Central Committee on the question of the People's Commissariat of Communications has already proved, is di distinguished not only by outstanding ability. He is personally perhaps the most capable man in the present uh, Central Committee, but he has displayed excessive self-assurance and shown excessive preoccupation with the purely administrative, administrative side of the work. These two qualities of the two outstanding leaders of the present Central Committee can inadvertently le lead, lead to a split, and if our party does not take steps to avert this, the split may come unexpectedly. This is what he writes about Stalin. This is what he writes about Trotsky. He's clearly, clearly making things happen there. So yeah, after Lenin's third stroke in March 1923, he's completely paralyzed and unable to speak. And even previously, there are there are documented evidence that Lenin at one point, at the very, the very time of writing of this testament, had been suffering from massive pains, and at one point he was desperate enough to openly ask for poison to die. This uh, this makes it all the worse that after his well, after his third stroke he's completely and and so this this uh, testament was kept secret by his wife Nadezhda Krupskaya. Well, she hoped Lenin would recover, but it doesn't happen. Just before, by the way, this this final stroke, Lenin also invited Trotsky to open an attack on Stalin, but Trotsky chose to bide his time, possibly contemplating an alliance against Zinoviev. Stalin obviously rapidly moved to consolidate his hold on the Central Committee at the 12th Party Congress, which happened in April 1923, and there it was obviously never read aloud. One of the reasons why this, this testament was never read aloud was because Stalin, during, this, during Lenin's absence from Moscow, had forged an alliance with Kamenev and Grigory Zinoviev against Trotsky. And these three people, having a lot of power in their hands, actually prevented Lenin's testament so-called Lenin's Testament, being revealed in this 12th Party Congress in April 1923. Now, what happened was that uh, Lenin's, Lenin died from final stroke on January 21st, 1924. And his wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, who had basically saved a copy of these letters, as Stalin, when he found out about this, these letters being written and saved, he ordered her to burn, uh, burn these letters, but she had made copies, so she had saved them. Stalin had obviously done that secretly, but uh, this is what this is what a lot of modern-day Russian documentaries, which actually like to glorify Stalin a bit, say to me. So I don't have a reason to not to believe them. So after after Lenin's death, she turns over the document to the Central Committee Secretariat and asks for it to be made available to the to the next Party Congress, the Thirteenth Party Congress, in May 1924. Now, obviously, having prevented this, this testament being read in 1923, the ruling triumvirate of Stalin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev, it leaves them with a dilemma. They would have preferred to suppress the testament, since it was, like, really critical of them. Mostly Stalin, but others get a smaller mention, too. As well as, as well as kind of, of, of their friend, of Bukharin, and he just yells at the party for, for a lot of things. They would have preferred this. But even though Lenin's comments were damaging to all the communist leaders, Stalin stood to lose the most, since really the only practical suggestion in the testament was to remove him from this position. This was the only practical one. The rest were about, you know, the power has been concentrated and we should, we should just make sure the central committee is larger. However, they dared not kind of, they, they didn't dare to go directly against Lenin's wishes just so soon after his death especially with his widow publicly insisting on having them carried out. And by publicly, I mean she even went to the newspapers and everything. She was really famous, after all. It was crazy. And by the way, by this point, leadership is also in the middle of a completely factional struggle over the control of the whole party. The ruling faction just being very loosely allied groups that would really soon just disintegrate and um, Stalin would obviously kill everyone else. Which kind of, you know, you can't cover up such things and, you know, covering up uh, whomever wanted to cover up this testament would in the end lose because, you know, his political opponents would just backstab them and use this covering up of this Lenin's letter to Congress, his final testament, as, as, a, pol in, as a political tool. So they made a very strange compromise. The final compromise proposed by a triumvirate at the Council of Elders of the 13th Congress after Kamenev read out the text of the document, was to make Lenin's testament available to the delegates on the following conditions. Uh, these, these were, by the way, 
uh, first made public in a pamphlet by Trotsky published in 1934 and confirmed, by the way, by documents released from the archives during and after Glasnost period. <clears throat> Number one. The testament would be read by representatives of the party leadership to each regional delegation separately. Number two. Making notes was not allowed. Number three. The testament would not be mentioned or referred to or even spoken about during the plenary meeting of the Congress. This proposal was adopted by a majority vote over Krupskaya's objections and, again, sources state that Krupskaya was really threatened of, you know, we can, we can just put you aside because at this point and later on there were major rumors about what was going on and how Lenin really died and what caused these strokes because Stalin was personally responsible for Lenin's doctors too. As a result, the testament did not have any effect. Stalin retained his position, and nothing really happened. This failure to make the document kind of make it more available within the party, it remained a point of kind of argument during the struggle between the left opposition and the Stalinist faction. By this point, this is not just Stalinist faction, this is Stalin-Bukharin faction. Now, Bukharin was a, was an economist. He was a prominent leader of the Communist International, but he hadn't really participated so much in the main revolution. He wasn't that active in the revolution, but he was an economist who wrote some really important Soviet economical works, such as The Economics of the Transitional Period in 1920, The ABC of Communism, together with Yevgeny Preobrazhensky in 1921, and later, the theory of historical materialism in 1921. He really focused he focused being an economist writer. And after Lenin's death, he also became a full member of Politburo. At one point, he really continued to be a principal supporter of Lenin's new economic po policy, which we spoke about. He also got allied with Stalin, who used this issue... because. Bukharin was very famous for being a major economic, major economics force. He was read by the Soviet Academy at the time. He was supported by the power. He could become a Politburo member. And he was sort of the progressive wing. So Stalin allies with him and uses this issue to undermine his main chief rivals. By this point, his rivals include his previous allies, Zinoviev and Lyon Kamyev, and Leon Trotsky, of all people. In 1926, Bukharin succeeds Zinoviev as chairman of the Comintern's executive committee. But, but, as soon as in 1928, when Stalin got, like, his true power consolidated, Stalin reversed himself. He espoused the program of the first collectivization, advocated by his defeated opponents, <laughs> yeah, which he kind of shot and exiled and dealt with because they, were, they weren't supporting NEP when NEP was profitable for Stalin, but at this point, he denounces Bukharin for opposing the enforced collectivization, because Bukharin, even though he and Bukharin themselves had really just been fighting for all this situation. Bukharin eventually loses his Comintern post in April 1929, and was expelled from the Politburo in November. He recanted his views under pressure, and was partially reinstated in the party by Stalin. But even though he was, at this point, made editor of Izvestia, the official government newspaper, in 1934, and had participated in writing the next Soviet constitution of 1936, he never really regained his early influence. And, <clears throat> when we'll get to 1937 purges, <clears throat> this uh, Bukharin is one of these nice people who were arrested in January 1937, secretly, of course. He was expelled for, from the Communist Party for being a Trotskyite. And in March 1938, he was a defendant in the last public purge trial. He was falsely accused of counter-revolutionary activities and of espionage, found guilty, and executed. Uh, of course, he was posthumously reinstated as a party member in 1988. But yeah, you can see where this is going. This, ladies and gentlemen, dear comrades, is the beginning of the purge. And our next episode shall be dedicated to the purges to Stalin's political battles fully, what happens after he completely takes, po takes uh, power, and what would be going on there. What, what will eventually lead to Stalin's bloody reign of the Soviet era. But for now, for now, I want to talk a little bit about... I want to, I want to, I want to spend a bit of time talking about NEP and its cultural legacy. Because this period also produced... In my eyes, 
some of the best Russian literature the world has to see. And the best part is, you can have it in English. See, due to the limitations of this podcast, we can't really delve into the massive details of everyday Soviet life during the new economic policy, because all these crazy political struggles are happening at that point. But, but, there are three extremely famous books set in this era, which I really recommend you all read. Two of them were written by a famous, famous working couple, Ilf and Petrov, or Ilya Ilf and Yevgeny Petrov, who were just always referred to Ilf and Petrov. These guys were natives of Odessa, and if you've listened to my show to any extended period of time, you know that Odessa is where the Soviet political jokes all come from. That's the comedy capital of Russia, so to speak. And at this point, they wrote two very satirical novels, The Twelve Chairs, and its sequel, known in English as The Little Golden Cough. Essentially, these books are just about a con man, a weird person, the great, <clears throat> the great conspirator, so to speak, Osta Bender. Both books basically follow whatever opportunity, opportunity Bender has to basically making a quick, quick treasure, like the, <clears throat> Basically, these books follow Osta Bender in his adventures of becoming really, really quickly rich, and is a satire, and is a complete satire of the Soviet reality. They, they're, they were written during this new economic policy, and they're also set there. And the main characters, by the way, generally avoid the contact with, with the law, but the main character position outside this whole Soviet society, that they're kind of outsiders, it's specifically, specifically stated there, that's the, that's the main part of this, that these guys are on the fringes, that they're the marginals, Osta Bender, obviously, and by the way, if you've seen Futurama, then I, I think that the authors of that show also had a little bit of inspiration from our great hero, Osta Bender, because uh, not only do they share the name, they also share the attitude to life, at the same point. I'm, I'm not sure if this is true, but it, they are very, very similar if you read the books, uh, if you read the books and, and then if you watch Futurama. Essentially, The Twelve Chairs is about how a certain Ippolit Matveyevich, who works as a, as a small clerk in, in a provincial town and previously ha had been um, kind of a, a small time, very small time, very distant relative of the nobles, finds out, as his mother, mother in law reveals on her deathbed, that they had family jewels which was hidden from the Bolsheviks in one of the twelve chairs from the family's dining room set. Now, obviously, these chairs, along with everything else they had, were taken away by communists after the revolution, but she encourages this this person, this uh, Ippolit, to, fi to find a treasure. And he obviously joins forces with uh, our, our smooth operator, con man, Osta Bender. They partner up and they set out to find the chairs. So they travel through all sorts of this. This is basically, it becomes somewhat of a variety and adventures and everything. And it's kind of interesting because it, it's, it's quite a short novel. But it kind of, it, it's there and it talks about all the important for the people the events of the time. There are numerous side characters. There are places and institutions and everything is, is said there. Because uh, and and they they make fun of of uh, they make fun of all these people all these new netmen they make fun of inefficiency of government officials and of course this book was heavily censored but uh, yeah recently at least in Latvia there was a version of this book and the little golden calf also written by them and uh, with with Os Osta Bender as a protagonist which were the uncensored versions where the where the parts which were censored by the Soviet Union were kind of left in and written in italic. There are multiple translations in in English, uh, but I don't I don't know. <laughs> at least at least in Latvian, they added a huge kind of explanation of that era's language at the beginning of the books, because really, they use kind of 1920s Russian language, which often in this era of new economic policy often sometimes meant different things that really happened there. But they go through all sorts of weird adventures there in these books, and the language used is wonderful in it. This this book, together with the little golden cough, truly reveals in a very satiric light what what was it there in this era? What happened in the Soviet Union? And these are great books. I highly recommend them. 
Oh yeah, and by the way, about the little golden cough. <laughs> there, Osta, th this is a sequel to The Twelve Chairs, and uh, Osta Bender gets himself in The Little Golden Cough another adventure, because he he hears a story about a hidden secret millionaire of the Soviet era who's named Koreiko. And Koreiko apparently has made millions through various illegal enterprises by, by taking advantage of this crazy corruption during the new economic policy. While all the while he's pretending to live on an office clerk's salary of, of some 46 rubles per month. And turns out, at the end, and I'll, I'll spoil it a bit, but um, he, ha he's, he basically has just accumulated insane amounts of money, which he can't do anything with. <laughs> because... Because even though you might be a millionaire in the Soviet Union, but there are no legal millionaires there. If he'll if he'll start spending any of this money, he'll just be sent to gulags or shot. Because this this main character at the end, Osta Bender, finds Koreiko, and Koreiko is completely completely okay with just giving him money, because he literally sits on he can't do anything with it. And if the authorities would come and check it, anyways, if they find find out they he has the money then he's screwed. If he starts to use the money, he's also screwed, so in the end this is a huge satire about how everything goes on there. I highly recommend reading both this book and The Twelve Chairs by Ilf and Petrov, because they're both translated uh, translated in English, and, and it's amazing. And the second book, which is kind of, I, I think, more, more well-known in the English-speaking world, is, of course, The Master and Margarita, written by Mikhail Bulgakov. And in my eyes, uh, my eyes, one of the truly, truly greatest pieces of Russian literature. It's it's also satire, so to speak, but it also involves some mysticism. There's romance in there. There's a lot of farce there. It's basically this book is essentially about how how a writer accidentally in his novel writes the truth about Jesus, like he writes the complete story how it actually happened while writing a novel about Jesus. And for that, the very atheistic propaganda machine of the Soviet Union and the very huge censorship apparatus puts him in an insane asylum. But he has a lover, Margarita, who tries to figure out how to get him from, from out from the prison. And, you know, Satan himself, here called Voland, arrives in, Mos uh, arrives in Moscow to free him. Because this book is interesting because it makes you think it... it uh, it's it's not a typical thing, but yeah, Satan here decides that you know what he wrote the truth about Jesus, and so let let's free him. I, I he like literally the devil devil kind of interprets this as he owes this much to Jesus. He should free the guy who really wrote the truth about it, which was then censored by it. And at the same time, there are also very interesting parts in the book which happen to be dialogues between Jesus, or in this case. Yeshua, Yeshua Ha Natsir, and Pontius Pilate while in prison, and and how all that thing was going on, going on, and it's a very philosoph philosophical book. It's it was basically Bulgakov's response to the massive atheistic propaganda, and to all this massive censorship of generally all the books out there, and it was kind of an interesting rebellion against all this situation, and it was by the way, firstly published. Only in 1966, many years after Bulgakov's death, and it was also heavily censored. And the first uncensored version of this book came out only in 1973, when it was kind of a bit more liberal, as as the new leaders of the Soviet Union wanted to post this on how they're now way more tolerant than the Soviet Union used to be in 1920s, during this new economic policy era. But seriously, if you haven't read Master and Margarita, do it. It's, it's also quite a satirical book, but... Uh, now, with all, all of these three books, they're, they're satirical, but if the first two, The Twelve Chairs and The Little Golden Cough, if they're more comedy, then this is one of those thinking books. But don't get me wrong, it's the thinking book in the same way that uh, that this show often is. Because we make crazy, crazy jokes here, and uh, this book is where the where the, gen where the genius phrase of manuscripts don't burn come, come up with. And this is an important phrase because, <laughs> because Bulgakov started writing this novel during the Nep era, at the very end of it, in 1928. But he burned his first manuscript in 1930, seeing completely no future as a writer in Soviet Union. But then, later on, he restarted the novel in 1931. And this really, this really kind of just lived on. 
the study lives on its own life. But yeah, the study goes that this book was inspired by Bulgakov in early 1920s vis visiting an atheist propaganda journal redaction meeting, which was then transformed by him into the famous scene of Walpurgis Night Ball. So yeah, I highly recommend you read these three books, and I hope that you'll stay over for the next time when we'll look at how Stalin gained power, or maybe a special on Lenin's mausoleum, and how the Soviets became the top embalmers of the planet Earth. At any rate, uh, my life's been a bit busy, so I'm sorry that this episode is late. I'm also a bit sorry that, uh, you know, this, this wasn't as clear-cut and organized as it should be. But I hope you enjoyed this. And, до свидания, товарищи. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits.